So I'd like to start by thanking you for this opportunity to come and speak today about my new book, Why We Eat Too Much. Um, this was published by Penguin in January and it's done quite well so far, so it's become a Sunday Times and an Amazon bestseller. And in fact, even this week, it's still in the top 20 um, Amazon bestsellers, non-fiction books. Um, and it's a book that is popular science genre um, that is basically explains weight regulation, obesity, and the obesity crisis we have in Western societies. And so it's basically a textbook of weight regulation and obesity for the lay person. And the idea for the book, the inspiration, came from patients that I'd seen in clinic as part of my bariatric surgery uh, um, assessment clinic who really told me their stories and sort of laid out, you know, their, how their life had panned out. And, you know, I spoke, I had the opportunity in my career so far to speak to hundreds and hundreds of patients that are so desperate that they have come to, you know, the department wanting to have drastic surgery, so stomach removing or bypassing surgery. And the things that struck me about what they said were their similarities between patients. So. Many, many, many patients have this experience that they can lose weight on a diet, but they can't keep it off. So they're constantly dieting, they're constantly losing weight, but then their body seems to adapt to the diet and they put the weight back on and usually more. Many patients say, yeah, actually, I think I've got a slow metabolism. I live with my flatmates and he or she eats much more than me, but doesn't have a problem with their weight. Whereas I have to semi-starve myself to stop me, me, myself putting on weight. And another really, really, really common um, comment was, yeah, I actually think it's in the family. I think it's in my genes. So I've just come from a family that suffer with obesity. And the sort of overriding um, feeling that I got from these people were that they just felt trapped within their fat body, that something was stopping them being able to, you know, break free and get back to a normal body weight. And at first I sort of dismissed a lot of their statements as, you know, just excuses. Uh, my understanding of obesity was very simplified, like most people's is, you know, you go on a diet and uh, you go to the gym, you can sort yourself out. Um, but so many patients were coming out with very similar stories that went against con conventional wisdom that I thought I would investigate. And that formed the basis of the book. Uh, certainly what my patients were saying went against conventional you know, public thinking, even medical thinking. Uh, I mean, the newspapers will always come out with the fact that, that dieting and exercise can cure obesity. Certainly if you put someone in a boot camp, starve them and put them on a treadmill, uh, they will lose weight in the short term. And we know that's true. But the problem is in the long term when they come out of that boot camp. So because dieting and exercise can work short term, the newspapers and the public opinion um, extrapolate that to suggest that obesity is therefore like a choice. You know, you can lose weight, so it must be a choice. Or if it's not a choice, then you must be obese because of poor willpower. Um, so basically, obesity is not seen as a, you know, a conventional disease, but a lifestyle choice. And I've been doing bariatric surgery for almost almost 20 years now. And we can do these great operations really, really smoothly and really safe. Gastric bypass and sleep restricts me mostly. And they are really, really life-changing operations. For people stuck in obesity, you do the operation, you see them a year down the line, they're a totally different, confident person with this whole problem lifted from them. But Many of my medical colleagues and many of my surgical colleagues still adhere to old-fashioned thinking about diet and exercise and how it should work and how actually this is unnecessary surgery for people that are weak-willed and it's even been described as mutilating surgery before. And when you sort of think about the education we get on weight regulation, it's pretty much zero. You know. Um, I remember Southampton Medical School in the mid to late 80s when we were going through the different systems in the body. We studied the 11 organ systems, but the system to regulate how much energy is stored in the body, this you know, critical system of the body was not studied. 
And when you go back and look at obesity rates, you know, historically, certainly when I was at medical school, the obesity crisis was only just starting to emerge. So probably between five and 10% of the population had become obese. And probably when the curriculum was written in the 1970s, maybe, um, obesity just wasn't an issue at all. So it wasn't a disease. Um, it wasn't an issue with the population and we weren't taught about it. Unfortunately, the curriculum today is the same. There's not a great deal about obesity, but obesity rates have gone up despite us not learning about how energy is regulated properly. Um, this dysfunction of energy regulation affects a third to a quarter of our patients, uh, whatever speciality we're in, giving us high rates of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, etc., etc. And I would suggest that obesity is a pandemic. We've been talking about the coronavirus pandemic now for the last six months. Uh, obesity causes 4.7 million deaths per year over the last 20 years. If you compare that to coronavirus, where we've had this massive government interventions and probably the potential for economic ruin, um, this has caused less than a quarter of the annual deaths for obesity. And again, the crux of the issue is that obesity is seen as a lifestyle choice. So it costs the UK um, 47 billion pounds a year. So it's something that's going to increase and increase and increase and put a massive strain on the NHS. So the first chapter in my book looks at weight regulation and looks at what we should have had in the curriculum at medical school. And we come up with a brand new term for it, metabology, from metabo, from metabo the chemical process of uh, in cells, so the processing of energy into and out of cells and the cellulose, so metabology for beginners. And we sort of um, jokingly put this in the, the curriculum, you know, in within cardiology, gastroenterology, urology, neurology, pulmonology, endocrinology and metabology. Okay, so this is going to be the fir your first lesson in metabology ever despite you treating 30% of your patients as being obese. Okay, so the first law of thermodynamics we know is that in any object, whether it be an ant, a human, a whale, even a rock or a planet, in any object, the energy that's taken into that object minus the energy that expended within the object equals the energy that's stored. So energy in, energy out equals energy stored. And for humans, we know that uh, the energy taken in is in the form of food, carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Now, the energy expended is less well known, certainly to the general public. The general public think it's mostly activity. But we are aware that basal metabolic rate, so the amount of energy you expend before we move any skeletal muscle, uh, is, makes up about three quarters of our energy requirements. Uh, and this is basically the heating of the body, chemical reactions, the immune reactions, the physical act of breathing and heartbeat. All of these things make up three quarters of the energy that we expend. And when you actually look at you know, the, the power required to run a human body and compare it to other um, things that require power to run. So if you compare a human body to an iPhone, actually, uh, the iPhone takes 10 times more power to run than the human body takes to tick along. So you can run 10 humans on the same power as an iPhone takes. In fact, each human takes the same amount of energy as a light bulb to run. So we're pretty efficient. And that's three quarters of our energy. Passive activity accounts for 20 to 25 percent, the remaining 20 to 25 percent. This is just our day-to-day -day activities pottering around, you know, going, walking to the office, walking around the office, preparing food in the kitchen and our day-to-day -day hobbies, cleaning up and things. And then physical activity actually accounts for quite a, a minimal amount of energy expenditure, unless you have the time to go to the gym for an hour every day. And we're told with this very simple first law of thermodynamics that if we eat too much, in fact, if we put on 7,000, if we take into the system 7,000 kilocalories, this will be stored in 
to the body as a kilogram of fat. Uh, and the advice is that in order to um, get rid of that energy, we should go to the gym and work it off. And it's actually, you know, this is 700 kilocalories is about a 10k run. So we've got to run for 100 kilometers uh, to get that fat off. And certainly the energy in, energy out, first law of thermodynamics, uh, way of simplified explaining obesity seems to seems to be um, confirmed when we look at the epidemiology. So if you look at the right hand graph and you see that in 1980 this is when the rates of obesity tended to start rising significantly. Something happened here. And if you look at the in increase in the total calories in the food supply, so from 1980 to 2000 uh, people started consuming 500 more kilocalories per day. This, these are US figures. So it seems to equate that people started eating more and people started getting obese. But actually, if you look at the figures in more detail, you'll find that things don't really add up. So in 1980, people were consuming 2,200 calories. In 2000, they were consuming 2,700 calories. So that's 500 kilocalories per day more. Now that predicts 3,500 kilocalories a week, 7,000 every two weeks. So a kilogram of fat gained per person in the population every two weeks. So 25 kilograms a year. And if we sort of look at that and think, well, what's the weight gain now in the population? It's not 25 kilograms per person per year. It's actually 0.5 kilograms per person per year. So despite us consuming a lot more than we did in 1980, we seem to be adapting to that overeating and actually only 0.4% of that excess energy is stored as fat. So the next question is what happens, what happened, or what happens to that energy that we take in? Is it expended in the gym? Are we all suddenly you know, going to the gym for three quarters of an hour and working out you know, as a whole population, I don't think so. Is the missing energy because we've gained weight and we need that energy to, to move around more? And again, that just doesn't fit in. So putting on half 0.5 kilograms doesn't account for, you know, um, using up that extra, you know, 489 kilogram, kil kilocalories per day, no way. So this is where I started to look at historical um, experiments that looked at overeating and undereating, um, and some of the more contemporary uh, studies as well. And one of my favorite studies is the Vermont Prison Overeating Study. So this is something that uh, occurred in 1964, um, and it was a study to look at the metabolism of humans after they had overeaten and become fat. So a group of prisoners were offered early parole if they could gain 15% of their weight and then 25% of their body weight by overeating. They revamped the kitchen, they gave them new china plates and cutlery, and every morning the American uh, prisoners would have a full American breakfast, which as we know is massive usually. Lunchtime would be unlimited sandwiches, Evening meal would be a large, you know, traditional meal, potatoes, vegetables, lots of carbohydrates, and then another full American breakfast for supper. Um, as mentioned, early parole for successful weight gainers. And the prisoners started to increase their eating uh, from 2,200 kilocalories per day to 4,000 kilocalories per day. But the scientists found that at this higher rate of eating, which would predict you know, weight gain, the prisoners weren't able to gain that weight. They were nowhere near the 15% and 25% weight gain uh, necessary for them to get parole. So the prisoners needed to eat 8,000 to 10,000 kilocalories a day. And this was four times more than they calculated had been necessary for the weight gain. Some prisoners couldn't Put on extra weight, they put on some extra weight, but even at 10,000 kilocalories per day, so the 10,000 kilocalorie challenge every day, and we're unable to put on any more weight. 
when the scientists looked at the metabolism of the prisoners, so the sympathetic drive, um, they noticed that it was in overdrive, so they were hypertensive, tachycardic, and hot and sweaty. So their bodies were hot. As soon as the prisoners were taken off their overeating study, they lost a lot of weight and went down towards not that pre pre overeating weight within a few weeks without going on a diet. Another fascinating uh, study looking at metabolic adaptation to um, overall undereating is the Minnesota starvation experiment. And this is a study that occurred towards the end of the Second World War when um, the Allies knew that there would be a lot of starvation, you know, a lot of migration, food shortages, and they really wanted to study you know, what was the minimal amount of food humans required to keep them alive. So they took a group of conscientious objectors. These were mainly Mormon people uh, who didn't want to you know, be in active combat, but actually were patriotic and wanted to contribute to the war. Uh, so they were recruited for this starvation study. And despite being told to do f hard physical exercise, they were only fed 1,500 kilocalories per day. After the study finished, 24 weeks, most of the recruits had lost the 25% total body weight target. But the scientists were intrigued to find that their metabolism had dropped by a lot more than expected. So they'd really, you know, they'd, they'd really shrunk down their basal metabolism by 25% more than can be explained by the weight loss. Um, they noticed a low pulse, low blood pressure, slow breathing, and low body temperature. So they found the metabolic rates were in shutdown, and when the experiment stopped and the uh, subjects were allowed to eat again as libatum, they put all the weight on, and actually, as most dieters would, they actually ended up slightly heavier than they were pre-diet. Uh, more recent studies from New York, from Rudy Leibel's group in Rockefeller, um, looked at the most accurate way of gauging energy expenditure, so doubly labeled water, and they asked lab workers to gain 10% of their body weight by overeating, and then lose it, and then lose a further 10%. And they found that at 10% weight gain, metabolism increased by 500 kilocalories a day more than would be expected by the weight gain itself. And when the lab workers lost 10% of their weight, metabolism decreased by 250 kilocalories more than would be expected from the weight loss. So there seems to be this metabolic adaptation, so switching on of basal metabolism or shrinking of basal metabolism in response to overeating or undereating in order to protect some sort of um, ideal weight that the body wants, thinks is best for survival. And certainly when we have been taught about basal metabolic rate, we were taught the Benedict Harris equation, complicated equation, you plug in your age, sex, fat-free mass and height, and it will tell you, you know, approximation of your, an average of your basal metabolic rate. What we're not told is that it's massively variable. So if you take a group of 10 people who should have similar metabolic rates because their size and age is the same, and you look at the top 10% compared to the bottom 10%, you'll find that there is a 700 kilocalorie difference between the extremes of that group of 10 people. So one person has to run 10K a day in order to eat the same amount as the highest metabolizer or the highest metabolizer can eat an extra three-course meal and still keep up with the lowest metabolizer. So massive variations in resting metabolic rate. So it seems that the energy out equation is not under conscious control and very, very powerful. The only conscious con control we can do is go crazy in the gym where we can expand up to that 700 kilocalories a day and a lot of people do that uh, if they have the time and money and interest. The next uh, area that I'd like to explain is the fact that the energy in to the amount of food that we eat again is under hormonal control. We think we can stop um, 
but over a long period of time it's really difficult. These hormones are very powerful. So there is a lot of emerging science now actually on the back of what happens with bariatric surgery suggesting powerful hormones are released from the stomach, go to the hypothalamus and cause either food, food cravings or satiety. So ghrelin is a newly discovered hormone which is secreted by the stomach, goes through the bloodstream and tells the hypothalamus that we're hungry and that we need food seeking behavior and ghrelin tends to go up if we haven't eaten for a while. PYY and GLP-1 are released from the small bowel in response to eating and they give the signal to the hypothalamus that we have satiety so they're the uh, off switch for appetite. Leptin is a long-term controller of our weight it's the master controller basically and it is produced from fat cells and the more fat we have the more energy reserve we have the higher the leptin level in our bloodstream again this gets read by the hypothalamus so the hypothalamus knows, you know, it should know how much fat we have on board. Uh, if we have too much, it's going to increase metabolism and decrease appetite. If we've lost weight and you know, we're getting a little bit too skinny, maybe there's a famine or we're sick, it will know that and it will decrease our metabolism in order to protect us and increase our appetite to you know, stimulate us to go on food seeking behavior to get that energy back in. So the reason patients can't lose weight on a diet is because we have these profound protective mechanisms, not only uh, determining energy in, so our appetite drives, but also energy out, our basal metabolism. And we know diets do work short term, uh, but we also know that they definitely don't work over the long term. Only long term lifestyle changes will work. So this is an interesting look at ghrelin profile, so the appetite hormone before dieting and then after dieting. Um, before dieting you can see this exact, exact shape of the ghrelin profile throughout the day with uh, peaks just before breakfast, just before lunch and just before evening meal. And then we look at the ghrelin profile of a group of patients that have been on a diet for six months uh, and lost some weight. And we see that um, their ghrelin levels are much, much higher throughout the day and even the trough of ghrelin in the mid afternoon between lunch and dinner uh, when you should be at your least hungry that actually equates to the most hungry to pre dieters so basically dieters are constantly ravenous and this, this evidence backs this up that feeling that they're constantly ravenous and they can't stop thinking about anything else but food. More worrying was this study looking at people who went on a, a low calorie diet for 10 weeks and looking at their appetite and satiety drives both after 10 weeks but also a year after dieting. So a year after dieting is the red line and you'll see the ghrelin levels are still elevated, not significantly but they're elevated a year down the line. So people have an increased appetite a year after uh, dieting. Significant was the PYY, the satiety hormone, that was significantly decreased a year after dieting had stopped. So dieting can affect long-term energy intake in the form of altering appetite and satiety signaling. And it seems that the body is trying to, you know, get us back towards, you know, this predetermined what it perceives to be a healthy amount of energy stored in our body. Do we need one month? Do we need two months? Do we need six months? And if we look at rodent experiments, we see that if you perform forced to dietary manipulation, either overeating or semi-starvation on these animals, they'll either increase weight a lot or decrease or won't increase weight as much as someone who's, as much as a group who've never had dietary manipulation. But when you stop the dietary manipulation and just let the animals eat again, they lose weight down to the overfed ones, lose weight down towards you know, the normal group again. And the starved ones rapidly gain weight, again back to towards a level of the rodents that have never been starved. So it seems that the body remembers and wants a particular, what I would describe and what we describe in the book as a weight set point. 
And we think that, the, and this theory is gaining a lot of ground um, and a lot of traction because it really explains what dieters are telling us. So we have a set point, for instance, it may be 75 kilograms and the upper boundaries and the lower boundaries may be two or three kilograms above or below that. If we put on too much weight on holiday, the body will sense that, we'll get an increase in our metabolism and a decrease in our appetite. If we lose weight because of a famine or diet situation, we'll get a, a response from the body, decreasing our metabolism to, to stop us burning off too much energy and increasing our, our appetite and telling us to go out and find some high calorie foods. And the weight, the weight set point is determined by an interaction between our environment, our genetics, and our epigenetics. And if we look at our environment at first, and I want to concentrate uh, just on food at the moment, obviously environment also includes you know, the amount of stress we have, the amount of sleep we have, um, the amount of activity and exercise we have. But if we look at the distribution of a population's weight who are hunter-gatherers. So we have most of the we have a Gaussian distribution. Most of the population are normal weight. There are some underweight and some overweight, and these are eating a sort of paleo type, lowish carb diet. If we look at 20,000 BC and what happened to populations when they started to eat a little bit more um, carbohydrates and a little bit more um, meat and dairy. Um, you can see that there is a, a shift of the curve towards overweight. If we go through time all the way up to the start of the epidemic, the start of when obesity started to really take off in uh, the 1980s, lots more carbohydrates and artificial fats. There was now a definite skew of the obesity curve of a population towards obesity and morbid obesity but some people seem to still be protected. And then we skip all the way up towards uh, present day where there's a lot of artificial foods, a lot of artificial fats in the Western diet, and this seems to be profoundly affecting some people. But it seems it affects some people more than others. So some people seem to be relatively well protected still, but some people to, seem to be very sensitive to the environmental change over the last uh, few thousand years. And the next question is what determines whether you're going to be at risk or resistant to you know, the food environment and the stress environment we have. And a really eloquent um, study looking at twins that have been adopted at birth and are brought up into diff in, in different uh, family homes suggested that this was by Jane Wardle, who, who was a research, um, a research epidemiologist at UCL. So twin and adoption studies performed by her suggested a 77% genetic influence to body mass index. So over three quarters of the likelihood of you being obese in a particular environment or food environment is due to your genetic profile. So if you're from a big family and you're in an environment where there's a lot of processed and bad foods, it's almost invariable that you will struggle. If you're from a family that's slim and you're in an environment where there's a lot of bad food around, it's invariable that you probably won't struggle. Now you can say that you don't struggle because you like cycling and you like going to the gym, but that's irrelevant. You like cycling and going to the gym because it's easy and it's nice to do because you're slim. There's no relationship there. There was only a 10% environmental, environmental influence in the particular home environment um, that these people were in. So you can't, so the underlying conclusion of this study and other studies that have, have taken place throughout the world looking at twins were that obesity is predominantly inherited in a particular triggered by you know environmental change and it can't be blamed on parenting or home background. We then go from genetics to epigenetics which is a combination of the environment at the time of uh, gestation 
and epigenetics basically is a description of you know almost the marinating of a fetus in order to stimulate particular genes switch them on and off to help that fetus survive in a future predicted environment and the dutch family birth cohort study uh, was a really really interesting study which looked at the offspring of uh, children who had been born from mothers who were pregnant at the time of a big famine towards the end of the Second World War in Holland. And these uh, women were on rations of about 500 kilocalories a day for several months during that pregnancy. And the study looked at what happened to those children in adulthood compared to their siblings who had not been exposed to that famine in utero. And it found that famine actually caused the offspring, when they became adults, to be more likely to be centrally obese and more likely to be diabetic. So the offspring were epigenetically primed to be able to you know, thrive or be more likely to survive in a harsher food environment. But when that prediction didn't come true, and actually it was only a short-term famine, actually they struggled in a more... Uh, a, no, a more normal food environment and became obese and diabetic. And both underfeeding and overfeeding um, during pregnancy can cause the same risks. So women who are obese during pregnancy have the same risk of passing on epigenetic changes uh, to their offspring. So I just want to mention, we've mentioned leptin before as a great feedback uh, hormone to stop us you know, gaining weight or losing weight mm. um, and to keep us within a certain weight set point. But leptin can go wrong um, and leptin resistance can occur just like insulin resistance. Uh, so we have leptin released by the fat tissue goes into the bloodstream and the more leptin we have the higher the signal in the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus will respond accordingly. If we have a diet which is too high in sugar and refined carbohydrates, the level of our insulin in our system goes up and insulin has a similar um, signaling system, sig signaling pathway to leptin in the hypothalamus. So the insulin uh, dilutes the leptin signal and this leads to the brain not getting the signal that there is a lot of energy on board and not compensating for that. So more fat cells are produced. And this means that uh, more leptin is produced. But leptin itself causes fat cells to become inflamed, which releases TNF-alpha and causes, uh, again, the leptin signal not to be released, not to be read in the hypothalamus. So we have a lot of leptin in the bloodstream indicating very high fat stores, very high energy stores in the body, but the hypothalamus isn't reading it. And the analogy in the book is you can imagine if you're uh, driving along the motorway in your car and you see that the, the petrol meter is almost on empty, it's, it's flashing red, you sort of start, start panicking slightly and think, oh god, I've got to find a petrol station to fill up before I run out of petrol. So you find one, you start to fill up, but then you realize that the gas tank is actually already full. The problem is the petrol meter is broken. And this is what happens with leptin. So the messages from leptin to the hypothalamus are not getting through. In fact, opposite messages are getting through of starvation. So despite massive fat stores, these people aren't getting that leptin signal, which means they have to go, they, they're getting the message that they're starving, they have to go home, they have to order in a load of food and have to binge eat at night because they are getting ravenously hungry signals from leptin resistance. No doctors are really trained about this properly. Certainly no patients know about it, but the patients feel terrible because they really feel worthless, they feel really greedy because of binge eating. And on top of this, you've also got to realize that food companies are very clever in producing food that actually does stimulate quite a lot of our uh, our brains, uh, opiate centers, opiate centers, cannabinoid centers, and gives us a real buzz. So you can, on top of 
you know, this physical, you know, craving for food coming from the hypothalamus, you've also got an addictive component of it making you feel really, really good as well. So I will start to finish the lecture by telling you what happens with my average patients. So most patients, actually 80% of women, and they will say, yeah, when they were a bit younger, they were size 10 or 12, and they wanted to get down to a size six or eight. So they went on their first low calorie diet when they were 18 or in their teens. And they lost weight, lost a lot of weight, but unfortunately their body adapts to that diet by decreasing leptin decreasing PYY and increasing ghrelin. So voracious appetite, no satiety, no metabolism. The girl comes off the diet and the weight shoots back up, but to a new higher weight set point because the body is now scared that we're living in an environment where there are future famines, future food shortages. It wants more on board now. It's like, it's noticed this. This is why dieting is so counterproductive. Every time you diet, your weight set point goes even higher because your body wants that insurance against future famines. We diet for years and years and decades until leptin resistance occurs. So you get this critical mass of fat becoming inflamed, um, producing in itself insulin resistance, combined with uh, an environment where there's like a highly refined sugar content in sugar and carbohydrate content in foods all blocking the insulin signal and this sort of end stage obesity of the disease. So finally, um, this is explained really well in the book, but uh, we don't have too much time for this, but we're just going to give an indication of how we can change our weight set point to a healthier level without going on a diet. Basically the changes should be part of a long time a long-term lifestyle that actually is in, more enjoyable than your present life. So we know that the weight set point is determined by environment, genetics and epigenetics, but we can't change the, what we're given by genetically. So we can only really change our environmental signals, so we've got to concentrate on food and the home environment. With the food environment, if we decrease our sugar and refined carbohydrate content, we're going to decrease our insulin profile that's going to help um, to decrease our weight set point. There's also a lot in the book about the omega-3-6 ratio. So omega-3 and omega-6 are essential fatty acids, so they're almost like fat vitamins. We, don't, we can only get them in a diet. The Western diet has a massive preponderance of omega-6, which is in vegetable oils, uh, processed foods, fast foods, and this has diluted down omega-3 on the cell and has a profound uh, detrimental effect on um, metabolic signaling, particularly of insulin again, and also on the inflammatory components. So I'm a big believer that omega-3-6 ratio dysfunction is a, a massive contributor to our, our bodies wanting to have a higher weight. Home environment, so I think cortisol is important. Again, insulin levels and uh, melatonin, I think we have a, a a relative lack of uh, darkness in Western societies. Melatonin is very, very important, not only for cortisol functioning, but also for insulin functioning. So good sleep, decrease lifestyle and family and work stresses, increase activity. Activity works not just by burning off calories. It's not that simple because we tend to refuel but actually it improves insulin sensitivity and decreases cortisol, which will slowly decrease our weight set point. And this is why the gyms do work. If you go to the gym a lot, they work because they're actually making you metabolically much healthier. So I think obesity is a really misunderstood, um, tragic, really sad condition that causes uh, chronic illness for a quarter of our population, diabetes, blood pressure, sleep apnea, increased risk of cancer, poorer quality of life, 50% of my patients are on antidepressants, life expectancy is now years shorter. And because we don't understand obesity, you know, there's all this societal prejudice, people can't hide obesity, it's there, you're big. Uh, and because we think that it's a bit of a lifestyle choice or poor willpower, there'll be societal prejudice. 
And even obese people themselves don't know what's going on, so they have very low self-esteem. It's only when they've had the surgery that they're released from this and they become a normal person again. So my research in this whole area has concluded, and the book you know, concludes this as well, that long-term weight regulation is not under our conscious control. A little bit like saying, you know, breathing is not under conscious control. Yeah, we can hold our breath for a while, we can go on a diet for a while, but actually breathing is under subconscious control, just like weight regulation. Um, our weight is determined by our weight set point, and changes in our environmental signals can alter that weight set point. So the book has now been translated into various different languages, South Korean, Turkish, Ukrainian, Mandarin. Uh, we're in discussions for many more. And finally, a thanks to the team, Elizabeth, my agent, and Venetia, who's done a great deal of work uh, organizing and making the book fantastic. Thank you.